For those of you, I kind of keep track of what's going on with the election and um, some stories I've read that I think could be very true. If you want to know everything there is to know about the election, don't watch CNN. They're not going to tell you nothing that even resembles the truth. Uh, huh? Yeah, I've known Newsmax. Um, there is a website. I quit going to Drudge Report. And there's a one called the Liberty Daily that I go to. And it kind of fills you in on some things. Um, there is, and it's sort of, this one's, this story is sort of uh, hard to determine whether or not it actually happened or not. So I can't say 100% for true, but the, the electronic ballot counting machines, they're computers, they're network computers, meaning they're accessible via the World Wide Web. Well, um, those machines built by the Dominion voting machine company um, their servers are based in Germany and there is a story that um, American armed forces raided the building where these servers are located in Germany and took out a bunch of computer equipment. Um, they also have shown that these voting tabulation machines are extremely easy to hack. They were designed specifically, originally, for Hugo Chavez to get elected as the Lord God of Venezuela. Okay, so they were basically designed with cheating in mind. And... Um, so anyway, what, it, it, just, it just seems reasonable to me that if the president knew that the left wing was going to cheat in the election, would he, with all of the resources he has at his fingertips, would he have just sat back and let them do it? I don't think think he would have. So there are some stories that have come out that have said that basically they laid a very well laid out trap knowing that they would cheat and then caught them in the cheating process. Sidney Powell is a, uh, he, she is Michael Flynn's attorney and she is also one of Trump's, she's on Trump's legal team that is suing all of these states to have the ballots recounted. And in Georgia, they're recounting them by hand. Uh, amen to that. And um, so she did an interview with Lou Dobbs the other day and basically said, we've got them. We've got them. We caught them red handed. The amount of evidence that we have will prove to the American public that these people cheated in this election. And um, so I hope it all comes out. I really do. So we'll see what happens. God is a God of order. Amen? I'm putting out a Watchman video broadcast today. Uh, it's being uploaded now. It'll be on uh, Sermon Audio and it'll be on YouTube. Um, that... Basically, it's dealing with the false prophets that Jesus warned about in Matthew chapter 24. And all of these false prophets, there is a spirit behind them. We, we actually see a story of that in uh, the story of Ahab. And Ahab was supposed to go to war, but he was, wasn't sure if he was going or not. And so he had his 400 prophets tell him whether or not he was going to be successful in the war. And they all said... Sure, Ahab, God's going to deliver the enemy into your hand. Um, 
But then Micaiah, the prophet, showed up. And Micaiah said, here's what I saw. I saw the Lord with all these spirits there gathered around. And the Lord said, who will go and convince Ahab, provoke Ahab to go to war the next day? Because God was going to have him killed. One spirit said this, and one spirit said that. Finally, one spirit said, I'll go and do it. God said, what will you do? He said, I'll go be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And so that tells us how it works. How all of these false churches with their false doctrine, their false prophecies, their false prophets, false teachings, damnable heresies, how they work. It's a spirit that gets in them that prophesies vain things, prophesies things that are not according to the word of God. And it's a very chaotic spirit. In fact, it's a drunken spirit. Um, when it's poured out on people, people literally act drunk. And I, I have a video clip and I play it in this Watchman broadcast today. A man by the name of Stephen Hill, who led the um, Brownsville Assembly of God Church in Pensacola, Florida. It's called the um, Brownsville Blessing or something like that. And for months, this church had services every night and people were manifesting all of these altered states of consciousness, literally acting like drunks. And of course, the preacher's up there talking about how drunk people are. And this one man, Stephen Hill, said, we need godly disorder. Now, those two words don't go together, okay? God is a God of order, ordinances, laws, rules, statutes, judgments. This comes first and then this and then this. Even when it comes to tongues, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three and that by course. First this one then this one, and then this one. Not everybody all at once speaking in tongues. And so God is a God of order, and you're going to see a lot of chaos uh, in this week's Watchman broadcast. So it's uploading now. It will be up there later this afternoon, early this evening. I encourage you to watch it. Genesis chapter 10. Um, I'm not going to read all of this, we focused a little bit last week on Nimrod and the meaning of this particular Genesis chapter. The Genesis chapter follows the numerical pattern that God lays out in his Bible. Um, Genesis 5 shows us the rapture, the translation, because uh, Enoch is translated into heaven. Genesis 6 shows us the meaning of the number 6. It's a number for preparation. It is also the number for, because uh, Noah prepared the ark. It is also the number that shows you the sons of God and the daughters of man came and mingled themselves together. Picture the fourth kingdom. Genesis 7. 7 is the number for completion. God ended the world in Genesis 7. Genesis 8. 8 is the number for new life and new beginnings. And so you have eight people in the ark and they come out into a brand new world. That's a new life, new beginnings. Genesis 9, 9 is the number to the Spirit, which are mentioned in the ninth book of the New Testament, which is Galatians. And the first thing out of God, as all of the creatures go out off of the ark, they're commanded to be fruitful and multiply. Now, the number 10 represents dominion. So in Genesis 10, Verse 8, you have, Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. I believe that's a picture then of the fourth kingdom. Nimrod, I think, is a picture of the Antichrist. He is a king and you, what you have is the first king, the first kingdom in the Bible, and it's a kingdom of this world. Now, uh, turn to 
Revelation 11, I think. Yeah, Revelation 11. You pray for me. I hurt my back last night. And I'm just in a little bit of pain today. Um, Genesis chapter 11. Uh, let's see here. Verse 15. The seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world, kingdoms, dominion, things that rule over people. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. When Christ establishes his kingdom on this earth, it's going to be for 1000 years which is a multiple of 10. It's 10 times 10 times 10. And then uh, look back in Revelation chapter 7. Um, the last thing said in Genesis 10, verse 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Now, there's going to be a gathering together of the nations once again. There's going to be a gathering of the nations who served God. And that we see in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So a gathering together of the righteous people of the earth, they're going to be gathered into heaven. And then there's going to be a gathering together of the wicked nations of this world. Think of the tares, the parable of the wheat and the tares that Jesus taught us. The wheat, of course, is us. Those who have been born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. And then you have the tares, the children of the wicked one. They're gathered together, they're bound into bundles, and then they're cast into the fire and there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I'm going to spend a little time tonight just showing you this number 10 and how it relates to dominion in our lives, things that rule over our lives, and especially the law. Think of something in the Bible that has 10 of them. Ten Commandments, okay? So think about that. Let's go to prayer. Father, I ask your blessings tonight. I pray, dear God, that you would um, uh, relieve me, Father, of the discomfort and the pain. I pray, dear God, that you'd bless these people. Father, through my weakness, I pray, Lord, that you would be strong tonight, that you would teach us great and mighty things that we know not. Father, we thank you, God, that you are a God, not of chaos, not of disorder, but a God of order. Father, my life, my desk, my lifestyle is chaotic, chaotic enough. It's disordered enough. And I'm glad that I have the word of God to come to. To know that everything is in its right place. Everything is decent and in order. And I thank you, God, that that's the way you made the creation. And so, Father, help us, dear God, to rely upon the structure, the order, the dominion of that order, the way things rule over us. We thank you, Lord, for the law. The law teaches us what's right and what's wrong. But, Father, we thank you, Father, for the law of liberty which teaches is also the grace of God so that when we fail in living the way we should live, Father, we know that we have grace applied to our lives. Bless your word. Bless these that have come. Bless these that are watching online. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Um, I mentioned this last week. I won't read this again, but Jethro had advised Moses to Moses couldn't rule over everybody by himself. He had to have help. So he established the judges system and notice that he divided them up judges over thousands and hundreds 
and 50s and 10s. There's four different groups there. And, but basically, these men had dominion over the people of Israel, over the camp of Israel, over the different tribes of Israel. And uh, they had that dominion by way of the law. And verse 22 of Exodus 18 said, Let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge, so shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. And we have that same system, judicial system, in our government. We have lower courts. We have courts where, uh, who's ever been to small claims court? You ever had anything going on in small claims court where you had to sue somebody over something less than $5,000? Okay, nobody here. Okay, um, but those are there for a reason. The Supreme Court doesn't usually get involved in a rent disagreement between two parties. Okay, it's not what they're for. Their job is to deal with uh, very, very weighty matters that don't just affect one person or another person. They affect basically the entire nation. But we're ruled over by those judges. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Turn there. God gave us. And then uh, Deuteronomy 10 and then Exodus 20. Deuteronomy 10, there's the number 10. Exodus 20, there's the number 10. It's a, 20 is a multiple of 10. Uh, Exodus 20 is the 70th chapter of the Bible. That's 7 times 10. Deuteronomy 10, verse 4. And he wrote on the tables, according to the first writing, the 10 commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, in the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them unto me. And if you look at Exodus 20, we'll read those 10 commandments. The first verse, verse 1, Exodus 20, verse 1, seven words. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Commandment number two, number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Uh, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy, and un, mercy unto who? Thousands, that's a number based upon the number 10. Unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. To keep God's commandments means to hold them and regard them as absolute rule. Um, this is God's word. This is God's law. We're not going to cast it away. We're not going to disregard it. Whether or not we're able to... Um, do those commandments or perform those commandments, we can still keep those commandments and regard them as absolute authority over our lives. And then uh, commandment number three, verse seven, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. You don't go around saying, oh my God, you don't go, when you get angry, say the name of Jesus Christ. You're not supposed to do that. I was taught that if you do that, then your mouth is going to taste like either blood or soap. One of the two. Okay? Um, so you just don't take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, commandment number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Um, and then as we go through this fourth commandment, I want you to look in here and see if you see any place where it tells us we have to go to church only on the Saturday. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. 
For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Do you see anything in here that says we have to go to church on Saturday? I've had several conversations with people. One lady I was able to convince, she called me and she was very respectful. But she said, how come you don't go to church on Saturday? I said, show it to me in the law. Show me where God said that I must worship him only on one day of the week. I cannot worship him on any other day of the week. And I read this passage to her, the whole thing. And I said, yes, God did tell us to keep the Sabbath, to remember it, the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. And he, then he told us how to keep it holy by resting from our labor, by not doing any servile work on that day. That's how he told us to do it. Then Jesus, of course, telling us that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the Seventh-day Adventists have it upside down anyway. Then you have the fifth commandment. It's sort of a transitional commandment. These commandments, first four, deal with God, loving the Lord your God, and then God is our father, heaven is our mother. Verse 12, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now the next five commandments are going to be dealing with loving your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, thou shalt not kill. Verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. Verse 15, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Verse 17, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So we have the Ten Commandments, God giving them to Israel... And I want you to think about this picture of dominion and what dominion represents. By the way, that those voting machines that tabulated all of the votes and the votes that came in for, Biden, for Trump were automatically switched to Biden. The name of those machines is called the Dominion Voting System. Dominion. It's almost like we are going to rule over you whether you like it or not. And I'll say this. If, if God allows Biden to actually be the president, God will have once again turned this nation over to cruel authority. Because they're already talking about cracking down even further on our constitutional rights because of this virus. And you're going to have a lot of people not very happy about that at all. Amen. All right. Now, turn to Romans 7. Some people have the wrong idea about the Ten Commandments. They, they pick verses out of the Bible that they like to make them say what they want them to say to excuse them from things that they're supposed to do that they're not doing or to not condemn them for things that they're doing that they're not supposed to be doing. Uh, one guy in particular got into an argument with his pastor about whether or not he should tithe. And the pastor preached about tithing and he went to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4 says, will a man rob God? And, you know, and they say, wherein have we robbed you, God? God said in tithes and in offerings. And then he read the passage in, this, you know, in the book of Revelation where thieves and robbers are not allowed into the kingdom of God. 
And so this man jumped him, jumped his pastor after the service. How dare you preach that? And um, so they kind of got into it over that. And this is what some people come up with when it comes to things in the Bible that they don't want to do. They say, well, that's under the law. We're not under the law. We're under grace. And they use that as a way to say, even though the Bible says it, I believe I don't have to obey it. I don't have to do what God says to do. I can do anything I want because we're not under the law. We're under grace. Okay. It just so happens this pastor was John Uter and the man that he got into an argument with over it. The man said, well, I know somebody who could probably clear this up. And John said, who? And he said, Mike Hoggard. So John pulled his phone out and he said, here's his number. Call him. So the guy called me and I didn't know what was going on. But I asked the guy, I said, sir, let me ask you a question. I said, do you tithe? He said, not all the time. I said, well, you're a thief. Well, he didn't like that. Well, I do things for other people and I give my money to my family. That's like tithing. I said, no, it's not. You didn't give it to God. You didn't give it for the support of God's house and God's minister. You didn't, you didn't do that. You did it however you wanted to do it. And you can justify it however you want to do it. But the bottom line is, you're a thief. And then he pulled that thing. Well, that's under the law. We're not under the law anymore. Look at Romans 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man for how long? As long as he liveth. So, when you got saved, did that excuse you from not having to obey the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery? Did that excuse you from that? Did, did God send it from heaven a license for you? It's like a get out of jail free card. Only this one says, commit adultery as much as you want card. This is your license. Do what thou wilt. This is what Aleister Crowley said. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Okay. He said that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. And he's talking about this body. The law does have dominion over this body. Verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. So let's say that a woman marries this man. I had an uncle that was kind of the opposite. He wasn't a woman. He was a man. And he never passed up an opportunity to be with a woman. And he was notorious for having multiple wives at the same time. This is back in a day before electronic databases. He would marry some woman and then he would leave her and he'd move to another state, marry another woman. Okay, married to two women at the same time. That's against the law. Okay, so think of a woman who would do that. Married to a man, she leaves him, she goes and she's married to another man. She's now an adulterer. Um, verse three, so then... If while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, Paul's going to say he was talking about us the whole time. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So, the Bible teaches us that our soul 
characterizes it as a female. Okay, my soul maketh her boast. Okay, so the soul is joined to the flesh body that you were born with, and they're inseparable. Now, in the case of most people, their flesh and their soul are in agreement. They want nothing to do with God. They want nothing to do with God's laws, God's commandments, God's promises, God's heaven. They want nothing to do with that. So the two are in agreement. So those two will be cast, the flesh will rot into the ground, the soul will be cast into everlasting torment, prepared for the devil and his angels. Everlasting punishment is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25. However, what if the soul sees that the flesh and the soul are both headed for destruction. The soul of a person says, well, I don't want that. I don't want to be destroyed. I don't want to suffer the vengeance of God, the wrath of God and everlasting fire. Is there a way that I can avoid that? Yes. You call upon the name of the Lord so you can be saved. You ask God, God save me. Now God saves you at that point, but God's final act of saving you is not done until your flesh dies. Then he takes your soul and resurrects it with a new body and you get to spend eternity in heaven. We have a story of that. Turn to 1 Samuel 25. It's a picture of this doctrine, picture of every doctrine in the Bible. We have David. David is going to be Christ in this story. Men in the Bible are either going to be Christ or Antichrist. Women in the Bible are going to be the pure church or a harlot church. Okay. Martini drinking church, drunk church, false doctrine church, Babylon. Now, uh, David in 1 Samuel 25, I'm not going to read this whole passage, but there's a man by the name of Nabal. Nabal's an evil man. He's very arrogant, thinks only of himself. He's cruel, he's mean, he's a drunk. David's fighting battles, protecting the land. David has protected Nabal's land. David is passing through and is asking Nabal, Hey, my men are thirsty, my men are hungry. Can you feed us some victuals and kind of let us rest on your land a little bit? And then we'll pass through. So he sends a messenger to Nabal. Nabal reads it and laughs and says, Who's David? Why do I care? Which is the way most people respond to the gospel. Remember, David is saying to Nabal, Help me out. God is saying to us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So Nabal says, I don't care who David is or who David thinks he is. I care nothing about him. I'm not helping him. So he says, take that message back to your boss, David. The messenger goes running back to David. David is furious. David grabs 400 men. And he says, boys, I ain't having that. Good as I've been to him taking care of him, watching out for his lands and his cattle and his sheep, protecting his vineyards. I'm not going to have him treat me this way. I'm going to go kill everybody in Nabal's house. Okay. Well, who's there? Nabal's wife, if you look in 
Verse 14, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. So what happened? Look at verse 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine. And five, there's a reason why these numbers are here, by the way. I'm working on going to present that, maybe a Pastor Mike online or something like that. And five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and uh, fig newtons, 200 cases of fig newtons. That'll make them happy. Amen. Yeah. Laid them on asses and she said unto her servants, go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. Now, Abigail is your soul. And your soul is married to a guy that hates God. Your flesh hates God and his commandments, does it not? Philip, does your flesh hate God's commandments? Sure it does. Doesn't want it. God says, don't do this. And your flesh says, oh, I'm going to do that. Oh, I'm going to do that a lot. Okay. So you're just like everybody else here. Verse 20. So it's so. As she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill. Behold, David and his men came down against her, and, and she met him. And David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. David's just very sore over this. But Dave, who is David now? He's Christ. Okay? The judge. The one who separates sheep from goats, who takes, tells the goats, depart from me, you cursed ones into everlasting fire. Verse 22, so, so and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. In other words, any male, any man. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted, lighted off the ass, fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground. Remember, who is Abigail? Your soul. Who is David? It's Jesus. This is the day that you got saved. This is the day. You bowed before Jesus Christ and you begged him, don't send me to hell. Don't send me to hell. I don't know if I preach hell enough. Every now and then, it's a good idea to be reminded of hell. The maddest that Stephen Leonard ever got at me, Philip, was we were in the Ron's big insulation truck. Steve was driving. And... I had had a dream the night before and I saw Steve in hell in that dream. Now, I don't claim that I get dreams from God, but so I told Ron about it and then Ron said, I think you ought to tell Steve about it. So I told Steve. He was furious at me because I told him he was going to hell. And he was going to hit me. He was pretty doggone upset with me. Okay. Um, had he not been driving that truck, I think he would have. But Steve was funny because Steve would get real mad. I, there was a couple times when I witnessed to him. First day, day one, he's furious at me. Day two, he comes to me and says, yeah, some things that you said were right. Day three, he's like, everything you said was right. I, I, yeah. Okay. Well, he's in heaven now, right? Okay, amen. So, but our flesh hates Jesus. Hates it and doesn't want to hear the gospel. So, Abigail fell at his feet. 
and said, verse 24, upon me, my Lord, and upon me, let this iniquity be and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, man of Belial, child of the devil, children of the wicked one. That's the tares. That's our flesh. Okay. Even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and fought. Nabal means fool and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand. Now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now this blessing, which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forget, listen to this. I pray. That's your soul. Your soul asked for mercy. Your soul asked for salvation. Your soul prayed. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. What about Nabal? <laughs> Amen. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house because my, and she's talking about David, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Yet a man is risen to preserve these talking about Saul and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the mid bundle of life with the Lord, thy God and the souls of thine enemies. Them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. That sounds like the deal with Goliath. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning thee and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. She is pleading to Jesus Christ for the salvation of her soul. And she's saying to him, you know, you're going to end up with the kingdom. And I'd like to be remembered in that kingdom. Remember the thief on the cross? So verse 32, and David said to Abigail, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice and blessed be thou, which has kept me from this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hadst hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. David would have killed every one of them. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him and said unto her, go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice and have accepted thy person. That was Jesus response to you when you asked Jesus to save you. He said, of course, I'll save you. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to destroy you. I'm going to receive the offering that you've made. I'm going to accept that and I'm going to bless you. Now, uh, verse 36, and Ab Abigail came to Nabal and behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. Nabal, and it was a party honoring Nabal. Nabal threw his own party. Everybody honor me. And his heart and was merry with him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing less or more until the morning light. But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal. And he, now he's got a big hangover. And his wife had told them these things that his heart died within him. And he became as a what? What were the Ten Commandments written on? Stone. And then look at this. And it came to pass about how many days? Ten. Ten. The law. You see, while 
he, and this is sort of not necessarily written out. We know at the end of this story that David comes back by and marries Abigail. You can clearly see that Abigail loves David and David loves Abigail. You can clearly see that. But Abigail belongs to Nabal. Were she to leave Nabal and join with David, she's an adulteress. David's not going to take her. He's not going to lay a hand on her. But he loves her. Right now, my soul is bound to this flesh. And as long as this flesh lives, my soul has to be here with it. But the moment this flesh body dies, my soul is free. My soul is free. And I can remarry. And I'm going to. I'm going to pick a better guy. Amen? I'm going to pick a better one. So that's what happens. Abigail can't be with David. David can't be with Abigail. But it's there. But they're going to honor God. So when Nabal heard that Abigail... That first of all, David was coming to kill Nabal. And that Abigail spared his life. Nabal probably had a stroke. That's what happened. Probably messed, hit him so hard that it caused him to have a stroke. It said his heart, he became as stone and stayed that way for 10 days. After that, the Lord smote Nabal that he died. At that exact moment, Abigail's free. So, verse 39, And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. That's Christ and his bride. And when the servants of David uh, were come to Abigail to Carmel, they spake unto her, saying, David sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. And she arose and bowed herself on her face to the earth and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hasted and arose and rode upon an ass with five. five. There's that number five. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall revise Rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. That's why that number's there. Or else, why do we care that she has five damsels as her servants? Why do we care? Why is that part of the story? It's connecting it with the rapture, the translation. Uh, anyway, with five damsels of hers that went after her, and she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. So, Go back now to Romans chapter 7 and look at that. That is exactly what we just said. The law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth, verse 1. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be, shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that, from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Jesus Christ. You should be married to another. Paul said it in Ephesians 5. This, behold, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Um, that you should be married to another, verse 4, even to whom is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And then in Romans 7, uh, Paul says, like in verse 12, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So, are we still under the law? We're not under the condemnation of the law. 
But is it wrong for us to lie? Is it wrong for us to steal? Is it wrong for us to covet? To murder? To uh, commit adultery? To worship idols? You see, now there's a difference. In the Old Testament, they tried to obey God out of fear. That if they disobeyed God, there would be a swift punishment for them. They did it because they were forced to do it. But now that we're saved, we don't do it because we have to do it. We do it because we want to do it. And it's a big difference. J.R. graduated school already. Okay? Early, right? How did he do that? He worked. The curriculum that we use, we've used this for years, it rewards those who have a mind to work. He would come in every day and set goals. Not because he had to, because he wanted to. And he set his goals, set them high, did the work, did more work than probably was expected of him. And we have had other students over the years that I ran a Christian school here. I could tell you the New Testament and the Old Testament students. New Testament students, they'd come in, sit down every day. You didn't have to check over their work. You didn't have to ask if they were cheating. You didn't have to do anything like that. They did those things right because they wanted to do them. And we gave them liberties. They got longer breaks. We didn't follow them around thinking they were going to sneak behind the building and smoke cigarettes, which we've had kids do. We didn't have to do any of that. But then we had those Old Testament students. The ones that we had to keep our eye on them all the time. The ones that we couldn't trust. The ones that we knew were going to break the rules. They were going to cheat. They were going to steal. They were going to lie. They were going to do everything under the sun. And they were under every rule that we had. They were under cruel authority. And they didn't like it. I don't like somebody standing over me making me do everything. Well, then do it yourself. Because I'm telling you, when you grow up and be a big boy, you're going to have someone looking over your shoulder. Right all the time. Amen? Law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. The law is going to ha has dominion over this flesh. And the consequences that I have to pay in this flesh body because of the sins I've committed... Law has dominion over this body. But as soon as it dies, my soul is free to marry another. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you, Lord. Beautiful lesson. Beautiful lesson you show us. Thank you, God, for teaching us about the law. And God, no, we're not under the condemnation of the law. But the law is good. Every time, Father, we even, even every time we disobey the law, we consent that the law is good. It's righteous. It's holy. It shines with your glory when you gave it by the hand of Moses. And Father, we thank you for your laws and your statutes and your judgments. They are right and they are holy and we keep them. We will never let them go. It's like our constitution, God. In this country, our constitution stands as our final authority in this country. And God, I don't want to live in an America without that constitution. It's worth keeping. And I want to keep it. I want to keep it for my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. God, I want to keep it for future generations of people, Lord, that will be saved because they'll have the freedom to do so in this country. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.